And welcome, everybody. Today, very interesting guest, Dr. Michael Yaden. He's calling us, uh, coming to us from the UK today. Dr. Kelly Victory very kindly recommended him to us. He's a former Pfizer VP. He had grave concerns about lockdowns and uh, the testing under which mRNA vaccines were brought to market. He uh, ultimately set up his own biotech company, which he sold to Novartis, I believe. He was a chief scientist at Pfizer and uh, primarily an allergy and respiratory researcher for 16 years. And uh, the, the biotech company was Ziarco. Uh, in any event, he's got concerns. He's got ideas. He has been vilified for daring to share them. And he's going to bring them to us today. Uh, check us out on Restream. We're setting up. We were a little bit late getting to the Twitter spaces. We'll be there in mere moments. Uh, of course, also out on Rumble. Be with you just after this. Our laws as it pertain to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous I'm a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying. You go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. There are three steps to great looking, glowing complexion in the summer. Of course, from our friends at Genucel. Most retinol creams are not recommended for sunlight, but Genucel's Ultra Retinol uses a powerful plant extract retinol. It's an alternative called Bacuchiol, which helps the skin stay hydrated, smooths out fine lines without harsh side effects, and it is safe to use outside under your sunscreen. Genucel works so well, you can see the results in this unplanned live moment on our show when the Redness Repair Cream repaired my skin in just minutes right before your eyes. And Susan and I love Genucel so much, we created our affordable bundles at up to 72% off of our favorite products at genucel.com slash Drew. And just for the summer, every subscription includes a customized summer spa gift box absolutely free. I know I'm a snob about the products I use on my face. Everybody knows it. Every time I go to the dermatologist's office, they're just rows and rows of different creams. And then when I get to the counter, they're overpriced. All kinds of products that you can all find at genucel.com. See what's in our bundles. Get ready to show off your summertime skin. Go to genucel.com slash Drew. That's G-E-N-U-C-E-L.com slash Drew. D-R-E-W, genucel.com slash Drew. And remember to use the code Drew at checkout for extra savings. I suspect you've seen Susan and I gushing over Paleo Valley products. We love the taste and how well they fit into a paleo-based nutrition regimen. They're delicious and we use them for travel all the time. But there is more. We are huge fans as well of Paleo Valley's grass-fed bone broth protein. It comes in three flavors, unflavored, vanilla and chocolate. It's a powder you can add to really anything. We add it to coffee literally every day. Smoothies, baked dishes, or just hot water dissolves really easily. The bone broth protein is made with 100% grass-fed and finished bones that are free from pesticides or antibiotics and are slow simmered to extract as much collagen as possible. As we age, collagen breaks down. That's what wrinkles are. And research shows that there are significant benefits to adding a collagen source in your diet. I don't think it's too much to say it's changed our lives. And Susan is now reporting that after drinking the bone broth for a few weeks, her hair is stronger and longer and nails are stronger too. Try it for yourself. You can order at drdrew.com slash paleo valley and use Dr. Drew at checkout to save an additional 15%. Welcome back, everybody. As I said, Dr. Michael Yaden in the house with us from the United Kingdom. He uh, is a former VP at Pfizer, where he was uh, involved with allergy and respiratory researcher there for over a decade and a half, and finally went into a biotech on his own. He has had some concerns about the research uh, around which mRNA vaccines were brought to market. He also has been had some grave concerns about the whole notion of lockdown, something that we have addressed many, many times on this program. Uh, please welcome Dr. Michael Yaden. Great to be with you on your show and fantastic to be able to reach your new audience, some of which will be new for me, I hope. Uh, excellent. Uh, so why don't we just get right to it? Uh, we'll have Dr. Kelly Victory in here in just a minute. But what were your concerns about the mRNA vaccine? And when you raised them, what happened to you? Yeah. Uh, so I didn't work in vaccines. I think it's important that people know that. It's very mm -hmm. uh, important also to know that the mRNA 
uh, and all gene-based uh, so-called vaccines are completely different from any other jab you might have had. And they're right in my, in my wheelhouse because I spent over 30 years collaborating with medicinal chemists to do what's called rational drug design. If you want a drug to do something, you don't just grab a handful of atoms from the bench. You think about the structures, where you want the drug to go, what it should do for how long and so on. So I think I can look at the structure of a molecule and have a good idea of the intent of the designer. And when I looked at the mRNA vaccine, I looked at the Pfizer one and the Moderna one, I was horrified because the mRNA uh, is it's injected into your body. It's a code. It's a piece of genetic code to tell your body to make something, some instructions to manufacture something. Well, when you do that, you don't give a single dose. You're giving, as it were, a course of treatment. And it could be some people will make lots of whatever that instruction is, and some people will do that for a long time, and other people will make very little for a short time. So you've got a massive variation in the, the impact of this stuff on people. If, if I could stop you there, what, why, what, why is that the case? I, presumably, we're all hitting the same protein manufacturing machinery, the ribosomes and the, you know, setting up the you know, the transcription of the protein. Uh, why is it so variable person to person? And, and, and why did you anticipate that? And why wasn't that more anticipated uh, by, the, by the drug companies? Well, I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to the anticipated parts because my contention is that there are multiple deliberate toxicities built into these materials. And I can, I can justify that. Uh, but yes, certainly what we've done here is add an extra few steps. So the drug has got to distribute like other drugs, but then it's got to be actively taken up. Your body doesn't want foreign DNA in its cells and will fight that. So it's got to be actively taken up. And some people will take up a lot or a little. And sometimes they will copy that efficiently or less efficiently. Uh, and so those two things will produce just a greater range of outcomes. But that's that's not my biggest concern. That was the first one I thought of. The, the next one is, uh, it took me a while to get here. Uh, I ask your audience to think, how is it that their body plays nice with itself, doesn't attack itself unless you're unfortunate and have an autoimmune disease, but normally your immune system, like they're like uh, military personnel. They stay in their barracks, they don't harm you. But when you're infected or you get a cancer, maybe they go to war. And you know the distinction, how it is that your body does that trick. It distinguishes self, all the things inside your body that are meant to be there. It doesn't attack anything foreign, anything non-self. It will attack. So when you take mRNA and get the human body to make a piece of a foreign organism, ladies and gentlemen, that's not my dog. <laughs> the, when your body is instructed to make a piece of foreign, non-human protein, every cell that expresses that is now blaring a signal, I've been invaded. Your immune system goes to war and tries to kill it. Every single cell that this material goes into. These could never, ever be safe for a mass market use, I think. Uh, I, I can only think of two legitimate uses, and we did discuss them when I was at Pfizer. One is to replace a human protein that you should have but is missing or defective. That's, that happens. And the other one would be if you've got a cancer and you do want to target those cells and kill them using immunopharmacology. But if you just give it to mass populations, they will attack their own cells and kill them. That is the reason why you see dozens of different side effects because it's one mechanism of toxicity, but expressed anywhere in the body, wherever it happens to land. There are many more concerns, but that's that's my first top one. And you said this was intentional? Oh, yes. So, like I said, I spent over three decades working with medicinal chemists on the design of molecules. The procedure is called rational drug design. Nothing in a molecule is there accidentally. What else can I tell you? Um, the... So I've told you about the non-self part. When you make a foreign protein, your body will attack it. There's no doubt that's immunology 101. The next one is they, all four companies, Moderna, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, and Pfizer, all chose 
the same parts of this so-called COVID-19 virus. It all shows the same parts. They all chose the bit that sticks out the outside called spike protein. So a couple of things here. Um, if I was leading a, a drug discovery team, and I did dozens of times, the chances that my peers in the other company will come up with the same solution is remote to tell, you know, to tell the truth. And you would never pick this. Why would you not pick this? We knew from previous work that the spike proteins that stick out from the outside of these microorganisms are biologically active. They can trigger blood coagulation and they are neurally toxic. They should have picked, um, if you believe the story about viruses, and I have significant concerns, but if we just go with the narrative, you would definitely, definitely not pick the part of the virus that is biologically active. And the fact that all four drug companies did it, it's a, it's a black swan event. That's deliberate. I've got, I've got one other thing to tell you that's so awful you have to hear it. Shall I do that? Well, uh, let me just, I'm just going to, thinking that I, I have never really thought about, you know, I've thought about the intracytoplasmic mechanism of how the RNA turns into protein. I've never thought about how that protein gets out of the cell, and the spike protein, that is. And I'm wondering if by design, the spike protein is supposed to be released as a result of destruction of the cell. I, I don't, how, how is that protein exocytosed from a cell by design? It doesn't, that's not built into the protein. I, I, I don't, what is that mechanism? Well, some proteins are secreted. Uh, I don't know whether this one is, but um, if, if it was a secretory protein, then, then yes, it would, it would be exported. If not, I suppose it would build up in a cell until it, until it was killed. Um, that's supposedly the model of a viral infection. But the, so here's the, um, the, uh, the, I think a real, it, this is something that's so shocking. Uh, you will make, you may remember that the J and J and AstraZeneca, they were DNA vaccines and they had a so-called attenuated uh, virus. I think it was an adenovirus, but the mRNA products from Moderna and, and Pfizer BioNTech, they were encapsulated in a formulation. It's normal to formulate drugs, to give them structure, and to allow them to travel around the body in slow release and so on. What did they pick? Lipid nanoparticles, LNP. I found a paper dated 2013, I think it was, 2012 or 2013, in, in which it was discussed in a peer-reviewed journal article paper that lipid uh, nanoparticles, the, the macro carriers for these molecules, are known to have a characteristic that's rather upsetting. That characteristic is they accumulate in the ovaries of every species tested. And in the case of the Pfizer product, the Japanese regulators required Pfizer to perform a distribution study in rats, which they did. And we've seen a copy of that report under the Freedom of Information Act. And lo and behold, it accumulates um, in the ovaries of rats. This formulation was chosen, in my view, in the full knowledge that it would accumulate in the ovaries of girls and women. And that, my, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, is what's happened to every single female administered this material. I know uh, Naomi Wolf has been making that case, and, and I've heard these arguments. And what do you say to people that say, well, you know, this was rushed to market because it was an emergency, uh, extraordinary times, extraordinary risks, um, these issues have been raised, and yet the the long-term effects don't appear at this moment. I, obviously, yesterday we heard some data that was rather disturbing, but uh, for most people, don't appear to be significantly, and the, by most, I'd say the vast majority, don't seem to have real significant effect. What, what do you say to somebody who argues that? I do think that the majority of people have not so far being harmed by these products and, and it is my sincere hope that they won't be i i do not have a copy of the script i think this is a crime i think it's a major global crime um and uh it is my sincere hope that that the harm that's been experienced that's it uh but it, it could be it could be worse so i i don't think very many i don't think a large proportion of people who've been injected have died or been seriously injured but i've i've given you uh, as an experienced drug designer or discovery person, multiple lines of evidence that I can assure you would never have left the meeting room if I had been running that room. 
And all four drug companies chose spike, lipid nanoparticles, foreign proteins, um, and, and also a novel technology that had never been used before. And, and so the, the thing I am mystified, the, what I'm mystified about uh, is I, I can easily, personally, I can go, okay, extraordinary time, extraordinary risk, we're, we're going to go at it. Um, why are we not going back and now doing the careful research that we would otherwise have done were it not an emergency? What we're, and, and this is every country on earth, every regulator on earth. Why isn't somebody asking for that? Isn't that weird? There are lots of people asking for it, I can assure you. But the, uh, the regulators in my country, the MHRA, European Medicines Agency, FDA, they, it's almost as if they've gone, they've ducked under the desk and turned the lights off. There's no sensible interaction with, the, with these people. But so the reason I was shaking my head about the extraordinary emergency, extraordinary times. Uh, so I, I've got a strong statement to make, <laughs> and you, you, I'll leave it to your audience to decide. Um, it is my contention that every single major narrative point that we were told about the virus and countermeasures was untrue and knowingly untrue. So I'm sure that's not what the CDC says, but I'm not doing this for entertainment. Nobody pays me. I've lost all of my consulting clients uh, and I've accepted no donations, either money or in kind. So I'm doing this because I sincerely believe what I'm telling you. We were told there was a major health threat and yet the record shows, and you can look at the work of, um, um, I can't remember his name now, blanked on his name. Um, anyway, there's a Canadian epidemiologist called Dennis Rancourt, R-A-N-C-O-U-R-T, Dennis Rancourt, epidemiologist. We, we talked to him. Uh, we talked to him. Okay. So I know it's controversial, but the fact is that there were no increase in deaths until the WHO declared a pandemic, whereupon almost everywhere, they adopted what I would regard as really strange uh, precautions. So, uh, for example, lockdown. Uh, I have read the pandemic preparedness plans of at least 20 nations as of 2019. Not a single one of them, Dr. Drew, mentions lockdowns. Never. Right. I, I'm, I'm aware of this. This was, this was invented in China. It was transported by a politician to Italy. And then the whole world followed suit because of this one politician who wanted to show, and this is well documented in his own book, that Chinese policies were an important uh, adjunct to political management in Italy, that he wanted to prove, uh, prove a point about his sinophilia, essentially. Not that he wanted to stop a pandemic, not, not that he was doing something medical. But my question is, what happened to us? Why do you think that all happened? Exactly. So. I remember at the time, it was March 2020, uh, and I was watching with increasing horror the kind of, basically they were not telling the truth on the TV. And I won't name names because it might get us into trouble, but some of the public health advisors in the UK, I've been around so long, some of them are my peers. It's shocking. Um, the chief scientific advisor is someone I worked with 30 years ago. And there is this thing that I know. Well, exactly that, what's happened to you? Um, he was lying. He was telling things that I knew Why? were true. Was and, he hysterical? I mean, was he psychotic? No. Was he frightened no. by I, something? What, what what was happening? I mean, I don't know because I wasn't there, but I think people were given, uh, they were told, given lines to take. This is your script. Um, so uh, we knew, for example, that people who are symptomatic uh, with a contagious disease are much more likely to be able to give it to someone else than people who have no symptoms. You know that as a physician, that the probability of infecting someone when you have no symptoms at all is really very low. And that's because you have smaller amounts of the organism. If you had more, you'd have symptoms. You can't have big burdens of horrible pathogens and no symptoms. So I knew this lie about asymptomatic transmission was, was a got up thing. And, and this is vital. Lockdown only makes sense if asymptomatic transmission drives the pandemic. And it doesn't. It's been tested. We knew it didn't logically beforehand, and that's why it had never been used before. It made no sense. Also, it's economically appallingly destructive. But by the summer, there were at least a dozen papers showing that asymptomatic transmission, they couldn't detect it. Now, if you're ill, 
you withdraw from society and sit on your sofa or go to bed or even hospital. Yeah. You're yeah. not walking around the station and the drugstore. So why lock, lockdown, all lockdown did, ladies and gentlemen, is removed healthy people from society. It could never have reduced transmission, and it didn't. So you can see that this unarguable. Why did all the countries did it? Even if China led and the Italian politician pontificated, what made the Germans, the French, the Dutch, the Brits, the Americans all right. do the same? And I believe, Australians, I believe, Canadians, I, I believe, I, yeah, absolutely, New Zealand. I believe this. That is the strongest evidence of supranational organization. Something above the level of the nation was driving these plans. And I don't know whether it's the WHO, the UN, World Economic Forum, Uncle Tom Cobley and all. I don't know. Something above the level of nation. And that's why they all did the same thing. They'd been told to. Well, certainly World Health Organization is going forward with a plan to be a supranational authority in a setting like this explicitly. I mean, they, but I do remember the World Health Organization being one of the earliest uh at least representatives, so-called, supposedly, of the World Health Organization, saying that lockdowns did nothing but damage uh, at-risk individuals, uh, economically distressed individuals. They said it out loud several times, and yet policies did not change. It was, it was a very bizarre time. Okay, Dr. Michael Yaden, we are going to bring Dr. Yeah. Kelly Victory in here right now. Uh, is there anywhere you'd like to refer people, Dr. Yaden, if they want to find more information from you? Uh, I'm not allowed to have anywhere. Uh, seriously, if okay. I, uh, the, only, the only place you can find me is Telegram, a place called Telegram, and I have a joint uh, channel with a, a, an Italian architect and a good, close friend called Robin Monotti, M-O-N-O-T-T-I, and then plus my name. And I, I, I um, post incessantly. Anywhere else I am banned, you know, really badly. All right. All right, Dr. Michael Eden, uh, we'll bring in Dr. Kelly Victory to uh, continue this interview right after this. A lot of you have been asking for more information about how to counter the adverse effects of the spike protein from COVID infections and the COVID vaccine. The spike protein is not your friend, let's just say that. So I'm glad we have the wellness company Spike Support Formula as a sponsor, especially since renowned internist and cardiologist Dr. Peter McCullough who's also chief scientific officer of the wellness company, is one of its champions. There's some very intriguing research around natokinase, which might be a way to take on the spike protein. Listen to this. So start, if you would, with talking about natokinase, how you got to that and, and where you see its application. So with the viral infection or the vaccines, the spike protein stays within the body and it's found in the heart, the brain, the vital organs, and is causing problems. The Japanese have been using this for heart and vascular disease now for 20 years, it's safe, it is a form of a mild blood thinner, that it dissolves the spike protein nearly completely. Spike support formula is the only product on the market containing natokinase, dandelion root, and a host of other antioxidants, all showing promise in helping you protect yourself and your family. To order this unique, specially formulated supplement, go to drdrew.com slash TWC. That is drdrew.com slash TWC. Use code DREW at checkout for 10% off today. President Trump recently issued a warning from his Mar-a-Lago home. Quote, our currency is crashing and will soon no longer be the world standard, which will be our greatest defeat, frankly, in 200 years. There are three reasons the central banks are dumping the U.S. dollar. Inflation, deficit, spending, and our insurmountable national debt. The fact is, there is one asset that has withstood famine, wars, political and economic upheaval, dating back to biblical times, gold. And you can own it in a tax shelter retirement account with the help of Birch Gold. That's right, Birch Gold will help you convert an existing IRA or 401k, maybe from a previous employer, into an IRA in gold. And the best part, you don't pay a penny out of pocket. Just visit birchgold.com slash Drew for your free info kit. They'll hold your hand through the entire process. Think about this. When currencies fail, gold is a safe haven. How much more time does the dollar have? Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with Better Business Bureau and thousands of happy customers. I do not give financial advice, and previous performance is no guarantee of future performance. Visit birchgold.com slash Drew to get your free info kit on gold. That is B-I-R-C-H-G-O-L-D dot com slash D-R-E-W. I want to share with you a teeth whitening system that goes beyond merely enhancing your smile. Primal Life Organics Real White Teeth Whitening System offers convenience and rapid results without harsh chemicals. 
light. Blue light for whitening, red light for gum and oral hygiene, and you can just do both if you wish. Works naturally, promoting gum healing, tooth remineralization, gives you a brighter and a healthier smile. Again, no peroxide involved. Consistent usage yields remarkable results. Take this opportunity to transform your smile and at the same time, optimize your oral health. Aim for five times a week for the best outcomes. Discover more about this remarkable teeth whitening system and other products at drdrew.com slash primal today. That again is drdrew.com slash P-R-I-M-A-L. Be sure to use that link for 60% off drdrew.com slash P-R-I-M-A-L. Do it today for 60% off. Some platforms have banned the discussion of controversial topics. If this episode ends here, the rest of the show is available at drdrew.tv. There's nothing in medicine that doesn't boil down to a risk-benefit calculation. It is the mandate of public health to consider the impact of any particular mitigation scheme on the entire population. This is uncharted territory, Drew. Welcome, Dr. Kelly Victory. We've heard some uh, challenging uh, propositions here. Dr. Victory. Hey, Dr. Yaden, I am absolutely delighted to have you join us uh, today. I know you're not doing a lot of interviews anymore, um, and I really appreciate you taking the time to do this one uh, and to share with our audience your your thoughts on this, and particularly given the, the time change. Uh, thank you again for for doing it. Um, you are one of the first people who I was following actively at the beginning of this debacle. And I would say there's very little, frankly, between what you have been saying, and what I've been saying from the very beginning. I've been very vocal about the fact that this is not mistakes my government made. This was lies my government told me. Uh, and I firmly believe that. And for what it's worth for our audience, we are bringing Tom Renz back uh, uh, in August on the 17th, Tom Renz is actually going to be exposing, I believe, the goods, the irrefutable evidence that not only did they lie, but they they lied well in advance. This was planned out and everything from masking to lockdowns to social distancing and then the vaccines. Uh, they were fully aware of the dangers that those things posed. Uh, so people should put that on their calendars. Um, I want to start, I want to go back to what you were saying at the very beginning with Drew, that some conversation you were having with regard to the vaccines. Uh, I raised huge concerns about these vaccines from way before they were launched as well, for a little bit different reason than you did. Um, interestingly, you know, as somebody who has an extensive history like you do experience in drug development, one of the things I thought was perplexing if you really wanted to make an effective vaccine was why would you target the spike protein, even if you didn't know that the spike protein was toxic, which I didn't know that initially, even if you didn't know that that was the thing that was thrombogenic, for example, that is the area that we absolutely know is the area most likely to mutate. You know, all viruses yes. mutate. Coronaviruses are particularly adept at it. They do it more quickly than others. And the area that is most likely to mutate would be that spike protein. So the idea of creating a vaccine predicated on a singular spike protein that's likely to change in about, oh, I don't know, 15 minutes uh, and, and therefore not be, uh, you know, um, susceptible, if you will, to the to the antibodies you produced. Why would they do that? I agree with you. Uh, that's uh, there's at least three reasons why you wouldn't pick the spike protein. One, we've touched on its biological activity. It's not a nice thing. You do not want it in your body. The second, as you say, uh, it, it is definitely it's reported as the site of the greatest uh, rate of change. Right. And so why, why, why would you do that? Um, and the third one is very important. It's, it's not as different from you and me as you could choose. What you would want with an ideal vaccine is something that's very characteristic of the organism and very, very different from you. And I'm afraid one of the things I spotted uh, early uh, was a weak but important homology between spike protein and a protein vital in pregnancy called syncytium yes. 1. Yes. Um, and and I, I just remember thinking, why would the hell would you risk putting a protein, so the, here, folks, ladies and gentlemen, the concern I had would be 
if they did mount an effective immune response to this foreign protein that was a little bit similar to you, some of your immune response might spill over and attack that thing that's slightly similar in you. And the prediction would be if that happened, it would impact fertility and childbirth. And all yes. around the world, what is happening? A fall of 10 to 15% right. in the rate of live births everywhere you look. Yes. And I, I reported on this same thing. And I think there's undoubtedly because of that overlap between uh, that normal human protein that is required for the implantation and the development of the, of the placenta, uh, critically important. So you've listed three things. Number one, that they spike protein by itself is toxic. Number two, it mm -hmm. is the area most likely to mutate uh, as the virus goes through its normal mutation process. And number three, it is not different enough from that which is self to keep your body from being attacked by, by antibodies that are produced to it. And, and number four, uh, and it's fundamental, uh, I didn't think about it initially, but I mentioned it earlier today, it's not you, it's non-self. If, you, if your right. body manufactures something that doesn't belong there, your body will think that's what happens in cancer. You often produce an aberrant protein you, and it leaves a marker on the cell cell surface that's a, and your your immune system says hey that doesn't belong here and it, and kills it that's that's called can, immune can I, surveillance can, your body defends yeah. you every day against mutated cells right. like that I, again I'm, I, I'm spending so much time trying to make sense of things and uh if you if you accept my premise that things were rushed and people did believe it was an emergency, again, that's a hypothesis. I'm not saying it's factually the case. Uh, and I know you have challenged that, but let's just posit that. If you're really rushing things out in an emergency, wouldn't it already be likely that the, when you pull something off the shelf that you already had well along the road of research, they must have already been looking at spike proteins or already been sort of postulating that they could use something like this. So when it came time to pull the trigger, they went all the way with it and tested it. I think you're a thoroughly good man, Drew. And I, <laughs> I, that, honestly, I think you're, that's a, seriously, it's a creative solution. Yeah. That, um, the, the answer is no to that, because here's the problem with that. Four companies were part of the way down the road with the same product. It's, it's not feasible, yeah. is it? They, they made an yeah. executive decision. Uh, I don't know when they made it. They definitely made it, but uh, they, they all alighted on the same piece of, the, of this virus or alleged virus. I, as I say, I have a problem with viruses that's only developed in the last few months. So... I am going along with the narrative for the purpose and, of the conversation. And it, it is odd that they I didn't go for the nuclear capsid protein, but it's just odd to me. The, the, a nuclear capsid right. would have been a reasonable target, seems to me, but yeah. yeah. I, I think if you also look at the timing of the uh, of the development and the and the um, submission of the patents on these vaccines, uh, it leads you to to the conclusion um, that this was not something that they all of a sudden, in the heat of the moment, in the fear of the uh, the pandemic, the fog of war, that they all of a sudden decided to womp this up. This was uh, calculated and well well in development uh, in advance of the announcement well that's my point pandemic. though that's my that's information. that's my point that they they had this sort of underway for whether they were ever going to use it or not now i think what's exactly. up to victory is and, and i'm saying the same that i don't believe all the pieces all fell together in march 2020 with literally 180 countries pretty much doing lockdown that they, they had rehearsed this did you know uh, if, you, if you don't, it's worth looking it up, that um, there have been tabletop simulations of global pandemics stretching back to 1997. The first one was held at Andrews Air Force Base, Washington. And there have been about another 15 or 20 of them. The most recent was the Bill Gates-sponsored um, Event 201 that took place in October 2019. And guess what, folks? The scenario was... Uh, from deepest China emerges a novel coronavirus that spreads around the world. From Wuhan. And they from Wuhan. Uh, from Wuhan. I mean, that's yeah. so. I mean, honestly, right. I'm, 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 I always like to believe the best of people. And I remember the first time I heard this, I thought, you've got to be kidding me. This means you were rehearsing the very thing that you allege happened three months later. And I'm expected to buy the coincidence? Yes. 
I, I but, think but, I think a reasonable person, Drew, it, will conclude yeah. that this has been years in the planning. I'm sorry. It's well, but let, let me let me I, let me let me twist that a little bit on its ear and say, we we are aware of this pandemic ink that had been created over the preceding fifteen or twenty years, and there was a there was a many many thousands of scientific hammers waiting to hammer upon a nail. Uh, in this case, it was the spike protein, but pandemic ink was well established. It, could that be your theoretical supranational organization? that had its way with the elected representatives. Maybe it was that pandemic ink group who were so ready to pull the trigger on everything. By the way, they had not contemplated lockdown till their Chinese counterparts from that very um, war game. They were the ones that proposed the lockdown. But couldn't that be the supranational organization you've been looking for? Well, I... <clears throat> Again, you're a very nice guy. You, uh, that's a very creative solution, by the way. That they rehearsed, I mean, they rehearsed 20, 25 years of rehearsal. Uh, and it actually, I mean, I've thought about this a lot, and I hadn't previously. I, I think, I don't think that pandemics of severe respiratory illness are even possible. And I'll explain why. And that's, if you have, let's maybe go to, to the idea of a common cold. A common cold for most people is so mild that if you have to, you'll stay on your feet through the illness. And so if we go along with the narrative, you could be infecting people all the way through your illness. And so it would spread around the world easily. But if we go to the other end, like a really, really serious flu, like they told us this was, it will disable people within the first day or so. And they will be forced to withdraw from right. circulation. Right. It will automatically self-terminate. I have to say, if God and nature had not designed us in this way, we'd have wiped ourselves out a hundred times already. Do you know? Correct. Do you know who made that case? I, I, I There's agree. a. No, I, there is I, a. St I, I interviewed yes, a smallpox <laughs> expert. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, you may have, but also a smallpox expert named uh, Larry Brilliant is his name. And he, early in the pandemic, he said, no, you don't lock down because when smallpox breaks out, people right. either keep to themselves, they, they hide right. away from the infected people, and the affected people keep to themselves. It happens naturally, as you're saying. Which is which yeah. is also, by the way, why viruses mutate the way they do. Uh, as viruses mutate, they don't become more and more lethal. They become more contagious and less lethal because otherwise they would eliminate themselves quite quickly. Uh, it's a survival yeah. mechanism on the part of viruses. Um, before I want to get in, something in here though, because because uh, Drew, you know, j defaults a lot, and, and you're not the only one. I, I agree that this idea of it was the fog of war, you know, they were in a panic, and we, quote, didn't know. Yeah, it was so new, it was novel, we didn't know. And I push back on that with regard to these vaccines. The vaccines, let's recall, were not launched until we were one full year into the pandemic. They were launched at the end of December of 2020 and became uh, generally available to the public in January of 21. So we are talking about, we had a year of data proving, we knew full well that children were at such a de minimis risk from this virus as to be indistinguishable from zero. We know that young, healthy people without comorbidities like obesity and diabetes were at fundamentally zero serious risk. The idea that we launched these vaccines on people who we knew were at zero risk defies, in my mind, yeah. this argument that no. this was fog of war. Dr. Yaden, do you agree yeah. with that? Absolutely. Having I spent my entire life in biopharmaceuticals, big pharma, and then my own biotech, you, you would never do the things that we did. And I remember shouting from the sidelines when they got down to school-aged children. You know, I was ready to right. campaign outside schools and explain to people, your children are not at risk. Please don't expose them. It doesn't matter if this is safe. You know the long-term effects, but the thing that upset me, and I was famous for this, you know this. Everybody knows the word thalidomide. 60 years yeah. ago, the, the U.S. made a wise decision not to launch that, that drug. But in Europe and, and New Zealand, Australia and Canada, I think, um, Lots of people were harmed by thalidomide. It produced birth defects. Ever since that moment in the late 50s, early 60s, we never, ever risk right. experimental medical procedures on pregnant women. We don't even yeah. advise them to eat soft cheese 
or drink a drink or have a single cigarette and you think it's okay to stab them with a gene-based uh, vaccine that's only a few months old, give me a break. You know, and I'll tell you what yeah. else. Yeah. They, they have no reproductive toxicology. This is my field right. between experiments and human. One of the things you must do is what's called reproductive toxicology. You study rats and rabbits in various phases of pregnancy. You count the number of pups. You look at their health. They have not done these studies. They still have not done these studies. And right. never well, let's talk, yeah. later on. So there you go. That, I knew that was, well, that was criminally dangerous. Well, that's a perfect segue because I want to go back to talking about those lipid nanoparticles uh, that we've known since way before 2000. There are the papers going back into the 1990s that talk about the toxicity of lipid nanoparticles themselves. Uh, Drew and I did an entire show on this and, and where those uh, accumulate. And we knew that they accumulated based on the biodistribution study, as you referenced from Japan, that the 11 percent of it uh, consolidated in the reproductive organs, specifically the, the ovaries. It's my understanding as well that at least two of the lipid nanoparticles that were used in these vaccines are not appropriate or are not even approved for use in humans. Or in animals. Right. Do, do you have any, can you give us any insight into that component of it? Not, not more than you've given. I know there are a couple of companies manufacturing them. It, it is normal. I will say it is normal to formulate drugs. Uh, often a drug is so potent that the amount that's, that you would take is so small you can hardly see it. And so you dilute it in what are called excipients and binders and formulation agents and coating agents. So I'm not saying formulation is in any way strange, but to choose these particular uh, novel lipid nanoparticles. So they're of a class yeah. of molecules that, that have, unfortunately, do have this property of dumping the macromolecules in the gonads, you know, certainly ovaries. And we yeah. knew that. It was a well-known thing. So it's not a mistake. They chose that knowing yeah. what it would do. You, you, you decide, ladies There's and gentlemen, what you think that means. There, there are three things that I have summarized, you know, to lay people that I say were the three, in my mind, the three biggest lies uh, with regard to the vaccines. And that's a long list from which to choose. Um, a, the, number one lie was that we were told that the vaccine, would, the mRNA would stay in the deltoid muscle where it was injected when they knew clearly from the biodistribution studies that that was a lie. And it goes to essentially every major organ system within a matter of hours. Number two, we were told that the mRNA would be eliminated, quote, very quickly from the body. The CDC's own website still says within a matter of days, when we know that it lasts in excess of 90 days, and that's only because those that's as long as they run the study. Um, and so we don't know for how long one will continue to produce these things, these lipid, these uh, spike proteins as a result of the mRNA. And number three, we were told no way, no how, could this be incorporated into the DNA? In other words, reverse transcribed. What's your understanding of the reverse transcription, that third component, the idea that this mRNA would in perpetuity or become incorporated within the DNA of the cells? Yeah, it, it is certainly possible. Uh, there's nothing about the design of these that would make it impossible. And it has been demonstrated, I believe, in human cells in test tubes. So, you know, yeah. we, we're at a point where you would say uh, that I would think a caution, cautious person would, would assume that it's possible rather than the opposite. Uh, and uh, the one thing I wanted to mention on the theme of how long these materials would persist in your body, I don't know whether, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, the audience are aware that um, this messenger RNA, um, you know, they make it sound you know, all natural, but actually part of the mRNA is synthetic and non-natural. One of the four yes. components that make it up has been chemically modified, so it's not normal. Mm -hmm. And you know why they chemically modified it? It's to make it last longer. And so, you know, again, what do you make of that, ladies and gentlemen? They chemically modified one of the bases specifically to make it last longer. And what are we seeing now? Persistent expression of, of the message. Uh, over months, and it could be permanent. Some people could constantly make low levels of this material forever, and I believe their immune system will will kill that tissue wherever it's being produced. It'll have to happen. 
Yeah, I think it was my understanding that they did that. They did the synthetic mRNA because otherwise, remember at the very beginning, we were told these were going to be difficult because they had to be stored at sub, sub, sub zero, super cold temperatures that made would made it impossible to then be distributing it in the parking lot at the Walmart, you know, or giving, you know, these vaccine clinics that were popping up on every street corner. So that was my understanding. They made the synthetic mRNA specifically so it would last longer. It would not break down uh, very quickly. And it was quite mm-hmm. purposeful is, is how I how I understood it. I've got another another thing that's it's not entirely in my field, but it's one that's directly adjacent to it. So there's a gentleman who spent longer in manufacturing R&D in the pharmaceutical industry than I have in research. His name is Hedley Rees. He's a Welsh guy, R-E-E-S, Hedley Rees, and he's in Substack. And he points out to me, Mike, uh, you should know that pharmaceuticals are like cars and aeroplanes. They're manufactured. Uh, or from various starting materials, and they go through intermediate forms, and then you finally assemble it on the line. And every single one of those steps is a chemical or biochemical reaction. You have to have target concentrations, purities, impurities, and so on. He said the R&D process to manufacture complex biologicals minimally takes four years. Four years. Yeah. If you take less, yeah. if you take less, he says, I don't know what the hell is in these glass bottles, but it's not what they're telling you. It's not possible to right. manufacture consistently a complex molecule so, in that speed. Yeah. That's, I'm afraid, so as, we're get, as we, we get into the weeds here, this is stuff that we've been sort of messing around with, Dr. Victor and I, for a while, which is that just to just to throw a few things out there is the issue of plasmids and what they're doing with the the rna particles and the protein particles uh as well as sasha latipova's uh, concern about the different lot sizes and purity and now we have a study out of denmark showing that four percent of the vaccine lost lots were responsible for 60 percent of the adverse events so uh, that was yeah. something came out just a couple of weeks ago yeah. in a very fine was, journal, was, and they had trouble the, publishing uh, it. No, I, I was at the scene of the accident. Uh, the person who did the work originally <laughs> as a British guy called Craig Party Cooper, Craig Party Cooper, and um, Sasha Latipova and Mike Eden saw the, this, and we made a beeline for him, and that's how Sasha, Mike, and Craig met. So I didn't make any contribution. <laughs> To the analysis, except to say, uh, you it cannot be tolerable that we have this degree of batch to batch variation. I remember saying to people that one thing pharmaceutical companies do extraordinarily well if they run their whole process is they make consistent products. So if you get the same tablet in Singapore or Sarasota, right. it'll be the same same material. But not if you've done it in a few months. Not if it takes four years to do the R and D right. on manufacturing. So that I think is, I think that's the most likely cause of batch to batch variation, but it's not an excuse. It might be an explanation, but it means they knew the variation occurred. They have access, manufacturers have access to the same uh, VA era data that you and I have. That means by March 2021, they knew it was all over the place. They knew it. Right. What did they do? They well, didn't withdraw they- any Nothing. One of the arguments I've made, Dr. Yaden, from the beginning of all this, to, again, to lay people, you know, right now I'm talking to, to scientists uh, with, you know, the three of us being scientists who have uh, varied experience in this. But when I'm talking to lay people, I said from the beginning, does it occur to you that there are a heck of a lot of viruses out there for which scientists have never been able to create a safe and effective vaccine? Viruses like, oh, I don't know, herpes. Coxsackie virus, Mm -hmm. norovirus, a lot of viruses out there that have been around that we have really tried to crack the code on and haven't been able to vaccinate against. What makes you think that they could hack up this hairball uh, in a matter of months uh, for something, you know, and say, oh, here's something. And it's not only we're going to use it on everybody and it's totally safe and effective. Roll up your sleeve. I mean, it was just preposterous. Um, Here's here's the other thing. Like nobody had been to the South Pole until someone did it, right? Would you have been really shocked or would you think it was normal if after 100 years of trying to get to the South Pole or climb at the top of Everest, four guys arrived on the same afternoon? 
right? Yeah. So four no. drug companies succeeded in, in making, within a few weeks of each other, four drug companies, notionally independent, all t- tapped up with their safe right. and effective shop. I mean, I yeah. just think it was, yeah. the whole thing was being to me. I, I I agree. I do. I want to go back to something else just before I forget. We were talking about the pregnancy issue, which was huge for me. The idea that we were we have never in the history of medicine given a drug or a therapeutic to a group of people on whom it has not been tested. Never. We yeah. don't do that. That's one of the that's a sacrosanct construct uh, in medicine. And if it hasn't been Critical tested on line. that group, you know, we, we yeah. just that's a red line. Okay. The few, few studies that were done on animals, I ju- it, it, it is my understanding that the mouse studies that were done, that almost 100% of the mice, the fetuses that were aborted to, to, from uh, vaccinated mice, had skeletal anomalies. They had rib yeah. abnormalities. Is that, yeah. that is, so yeah, they had skeletal, exactly. go ahead. No, Sorry, you're go ahead. exactly right. So- Two things. One, you would not administer to pregnant women. Uh, you, you would need reproductive toxicology complete. And not only that, you would need to have a clean profile. You, you, so it's not just a matter of mechanically doing it. No, oh, look, here's some skeletal malformations. Let's dose pregnant women. So if you observed in test animals some points of concern, you would give it a, I can't remember what the letter is, but you would say pregnancy category X. And, and on certain letters, you never, ever administer it to pregnant women. And even women of childbearing potential, you say, if Correct. I give the, if I prescribe this to you, I'm going to ask you to use highly effective means of contraception because of this risk. And that's the category that's where it belonged in. Yeah. I can tell you, I, I went to Duke University for undergrad, a huge medical center there. And it was always very irritating to me that the guys could constantly, they could sign up and make extra cash on the side to be a, a subject in lots and lots of different drug and therapy experiments. And I, because I, I was it. a female, just because yeah. I was of childbearing age and potential, was not able to sign up for any of them. So they'd get, you know, thousand dollars for participating in this drug study or five hundred bucks for doing this, you know, therapy, um, because they were young, healthy males in those. But as the females, we were not even allowed to sign up because of the potential that we could be pregnant. I mean, this that is how what a red line that is uh, normally and why that was breached here, I think is absolutely unconscionable. It's immoral, it's unethical, uh, and we need to get to the bottom of it. Um, I'm watching as the time clock um, winds down here. One of the things I really wanna talk with you about because you have been um, perhaps more than, more than most others egregiously censored. You have been shut down. You just said you can't even give us a a social media uh, place to find you because you've been deplatformed. Talk a little bit just about from your experience with that and what you think it portends for the future of medicine and healthcare and open discourse. Yeah, it's it's uh, science. I, I wanted to be a scientist since I was a little boy. And I'd had a whole career in science, and it's only after, pretty much after I'd retired, you know, I was doing a little light consulting, that I realized that lots of things are not what I had understood them to be. I feel almost embarrassed that I didn't know these things, that degree of corruption, not just in pharmaceuticals, but in regulatory and in, even in peer-reviewed journal articles, that basically um, you can only get published if, you, if you're, what you're saying is in line broadly with the with going with the grain of a particular journal's ethos, and and as soon as you're in this position, as all of us uh, are here, you have a position that's critical of the dominant narrative. On oh my word, you, you, the door is closed on your fingers so fast you don't even get a chance to have a dis- discussion. And if that yeah. continues, ladies and gentlemen, my my field and I'm only a, I only use part of it. Uh, my field, investigative biological science, is dead on its feet. If you can't have Mm -hmm. people coming up with um, challenging hypotheses, because, look, if I'm wrong, I do not mind being proved wrong in public. I'll apologize, but I'm not wrong. I I called out the toxicities of these products before any of them had emergency use authorizations. Myself and a German doctor called Wolfgang Bodarg, we put it in writing. 
about three weeks before the first one had had authorization. That was a big call, I can promise you. I didn't sleep the night before we did that. But I did it because I was I looked and checked my homework and I was so sure this was wrong that I was willing to throw my career down the down the pan and I did. I was fired within weeks from every other consulting gig I had, which is a little odd, don't you think? Um, so but I want if I may, I, I, I so I believe what's happened is that there were 25 years of planning, tabletop simulations of pandemics, so that eventually this thing, whatever it actually was, when that occurred, the world nice and neatly followed the plan that it had rehearsed for 25 years. Uh, that, that, that's definitely occurred. It's a military, civilian, international group have been doing this for ages. And I don't think it's legitimate. I don't think pandemics are even, I don't think they are the threat that they say they are, which is why we haven't had very many. And I think some of the ones we've had have been a little suspect, shall we say. So on the one hand, you've got that. Why in the world would you do that? I'm afraid you need to give me two minutes to say why I think this is happening. But, yeah, um, please. Well, I, this is <laughs> this is scary. I, I think this, this episode starting in 2020 is never going to end unless enough of us wake up and say, to hell with it. You know, we're not we're not going to comply with this nonsense anymore. Um, and I, I think what's happening here is if we continue, we're going to end up all of us carrying digital ID. Now, you might think digital ID is no big deal. Don't you have digital passports? But no, there's something coming and it's definitely coming um, that's different. So first, your passport, there's 190 different formats in the world. There isn't one format. What is coming now globally is a single format digital ID. Second, it will be what's called interoperable. When you when your ID pings the system, not only can it make a decision as to whether to allow you to enter a door or buy a product, but it can make a mark on that digital ID and edit it. That's not true of any ID at the moment. That's called interoperability, global format. And here's the worst part. It contains all of you your health data, your unique ID data, your financial data, your driving history, where you live, what you've bought. Uh, basically, it's a QR code that takes you to a website called Mike Evans Life. And that is, what, that is what is coming down the pike for us. If you don't believe me, then uh, I'm just going to paint a picture as to why it's the last important decision free humans are ever going to make. And I'm going to refuse it, even though it may exclude me from banking, for example. I don't need digital ID. You don't need digital ID. Evidence for that? My last 63 years of my life. They need you to have it, the people who have run this pandemic. Um, what else? What are they going to do with this? Um, the other two things that are coming down the pike are the gradual erosion of cash. You will, All of you who are listening to me will be able to see that uh, cash is getting harder to obtain and harder to use. And lots of supermarkets are getting rid of humans, so it's only a machine. And I promise you, as is happening in France and the UK where I live, they're abolishing the checkout assistant. You'll only better pay with a bank card or an app, no cash. And finally, you can check this out. All central banks are toying with what's called central bank digital currencies. You will bond with the central bank in your country. So now let me give you a scenario. You walk up to the shop door. And you're required to beep your digital ID. So because we're moving into what has been described as the zero trust world. These are not my words. These are their words. Zero trust world. So you need to prove who you are at every moment. You wave your ID. If they've decided, so because I've said bad things on social media, they're not going to admit me to food stores, the door will not open. So this is how bad it is. Let's say they let me in the store and I have had a steak yesterday and I go to the butcher's counter and I pick up some meat and I go to the automated checkout. The computer in the sky checks and says, you've already had eight ounces of steak, nothing for you. And when I try and pay for it, the money won't pay for it. Or if they say, here's something that will frighten you, uh, because this has happened in Britain, uh, lockdown. It, climate lockdowns are being mooted. It's absurd, but they are. If they say to you, you may not move more than five miles from your registered address, and you are six miles from home and go into a store and you attempt to buy a bottle of water or a sandwich, your central bank digital currency and digital ID will prevent that transaction occurring. That's what is coming for us. So 
when they say, oh, you need a digital ID so you can prove who you are, tell them to, you know, insert it somewhere else. You do not need digital ID. They need you to have because that's the control mechanism. There are only two parts to it. Digital ID, interoperable, one format in the globe, and cashless CBDC. That's it. And then finally, I believe this is what's going to happen. I wish it didn't, and I pray to God I'm wrong. Um, I think that the third dimension of this is the population. Uh, why? Because there's been lots of things that have happened in the last three and a half years that have actively increased the amount of injuries and deaths. I know it's upsetting for people to hear that, but I, I am very sure of this, and I'm not the only person saying it. Uh, and I've pointed out to you as an experienced pharmaceutical researcher that the design of these mRNA-based vaccines are, are inherently dangerous. What I can tell you is the companies and the governments have said they're so happy with the performance of these products, they are busy building factories to manufacture billions of doses of them around every continent on the world. So what I think they're going to do is you'll have your digital ID if you're unwise enough to sign up for it, no cash and only central bank digital currencies. The WHO will tell you there's a pandemic. Remember, they're looking for these powers right now. They'll say there's a pandemic. That's their job. Pharmaceutical companies will cook up the mRNA, inverted commas, vaccine appropriate, and then that's their part. And then the government will tell you you have to have the jab to keep your digital ID valid. And I think most people will turn up and get the jab. And I think over a period of years, the people running this can trim the population to any number they like with plausible deniability. So if I'm wrong, don't take a digital ID because then it can't happen, can it? Don't ever let them take cash away because then this can't happen, can it? So those two things, any government that tries to take cash away from you and forces you to identify yourself digitally is a criminal government. I would advise you to uh, do what um, Jefferson Davis said. You have the right to amend or abolish a government that uh, injures the purposes for which it was established to serve. I read that this morning, and I'm an English guy, and it resonated with me. Yeah. Well, I, I, it's sobering, sobering words. I will, I will certainly say, I fear that you are on the right. When we look, for example, Nigel Farage, if, and for those who don't know him, you know, he's a, you know, I think of as Mr. Brexit uh, in the UK. It's my understanding that his bank accounts were shut down. Uh, he was essentially shut down and kicked out of his bank. And if you can't bank, if, if you have no way to keep nowhere to keep your your cash, uh, you are really disenfranchised from society. Uh, and he clearly was as being punished for his viewpoints, uh, which go against the narrative of, of the government. So I, I don't think what you're saying is so far fetched. Um, I have also said from the beginning that I, I believe that the entire purpose of this pandemic was to make mRNA a household word, to make people believe that it is safe and effective and well trusted and totally well tested and just sort of standard stuff. Because how, and, and they were very successful at it, by the way. We have, you know, think about the, the number of people in this country, certainly in the United States, who wouldn't dream of eating a genetically modified tomato, you know, or giving their mm. kid a non organic carrot. Yet they were there rolling up their sleeve, oh, please, you know, I'll have another um, on something that's, you know, barely been tested. It, it, it's insanity. But if they were successful in making people believe that this is tried and true and well tested, that and they're now putting it into the food source, mRNA is into the food sources. We know that they're looking at non-injectable ways to get it to you, aerosolizing it, uh, taking it orally, lots of other ways. I, I think they intend to move this platform forward. Is is yeah. that your your thought? Dr. Dr. Victory, I have explained as a, as a biologist of almost 40 years since I started training, the things I've told you about uh, the induction of a, of a non-self protein in your body and your immune system recognizing that as inappropriate and attacking and killing every cell that expresses that tells you, ladies and gentlemen, that whatever else you're being told, you should not accept uh, genetic-based injections that will make your body manufacture something that doesn't belong there. It's inherently dangerous. All of them will be inherently dangerous. I promise you. I, I want to go back to your warnings, your warnings about the uh, digital health uh, 
uh, yeah. uh, ID, ID, whatever we call it, th there is already a pressure point people can turn to if they want to do something to reduce the risk of all that happening. The World Health Organization is on an active campaign for an international treaty or whatever they're calling it. And in addition to everything you said, which is in that treaty, they also want to make human life uh, essentially equivalent or of equal value as any other organism on the planet and geology itself. So if some geological phenomenon is being challenged, your life may not ma at least has equal valence to a volcano or something. The, 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 they have all, very, very odd stuff in there. And, the, the, and but really what they're going for with that is they're going to use it to mandate climate behavior and and cl how that how they're going to get that sort of under control so to speak afraid, but be, talk to your government treaty. officials about this treaty do not let them sign this treaty do not let the country you elected your officials these are not elected officials they're granting themselves fiat authority over your duly elected officials that should never right. ever happen Definitely. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, I mean, I've come to the conclusion that uh, that COVID is entirely a fraud supported by uh, propaganda uh, and a very bad clinical diagnostic called PCR, which I know quite a lot about. Yeah. Uh, so I, you know, so but I won't I won't use up too much time on that. By the way, I've got I've got a test um, for your audience. You might think this guy is a little crazy. Um, but uh, here's, a, here's a point. I think search, like a search engine, is a kind of generic uh, uh, kind of technology. Why don't you search after this program and use the word Dr. Mike Yeadon, put it in Safari, put it in Google, and just take a little glance at what, what comes back. Oh, doctor. Then go, then go and look at some Caleb. minor search. Caleb did that. Oh, yes. Caleb yes. did that. I actually, okay. actually had this prepared because it was so egregious. Whenever you it's search your name, Look at the top yes. results that come up immediately. Every single result here portrays you as if you are an anti-vax hero and completely skips everything else legitimate that you've done. All of these listings. And in fact, if someone, if someone was to click on, let's say this listed profile over in the corner over here, where it says, you know, under your name, profiles for Twitter over here. What that links to is a fake profile that isn't even you. That's just attacking you. It's a troll <laughs> profile. This, yeah. this to so me is, fun. this is ridiculous. What that tells you, it's never what you say. It's always what everybody says you said. It's That's never exactly what you wrong. say. This is the insanity of the present moment. And the press yes. is the most egregious perpetrator. They're ground yes. zero for this. Social media well, is trolling and whatever. But it's the yes. press that takes what you said right. and twists it. Great. And then that so goes are, viral. You are so right. And the point is, I'm not a very important person. I was like a just about early retired guy. What made me unique is that I could see what was happening was wrong, and I had the courage to stand up and say no. Uh, and that made me more and, and you're willing to be wrong yourself, by but, the way. You said but, repeatedly but, but, that you but, could be wrong, but, which, fine. Wrong. You could be wrong. I would hope to be wrong. I would love to be wrong. Yeah. When I was yeah. growing up, I, I'm, the, I'm the daughter of an attorney. When I was growing up, the concepts, uh, the legal concepts of libel and slander actually meant something. Now they are meaningless. <laughs> they are absolutely yes. wondered. My father would be whirling in his grave. They, they were absolutely meaningless. I had myself a hit job, an absolutely slanderous, libelous, baseless hit job written about me by Quack Watch. I don't know if you're familiar with Quack Watch. It's run by... Wait, wait. <laughs> Oh, yes. Well, it's run by a defrocked 90-year-old uh, psychiatrist. Um, but they can post anything, and people will continue to read. Once it's posted and in print, it becomes de facto truth. It becomes a de facto evidence that you are this thing. And they will then use that to you know, character assassinate you or to otherwise uh, disregard anything you have to say. I want to add something. So thank you very much, uh, team, for, for checking that out. But the, here's the vital thing. Here's the vital thing. If you search the same Dr. Mike Yeadon using minority search engines, I, 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 I don't own any stock in them, but there's one called Yandex, Y-A-N-D-E-X. 
and another one called uh, Mojik, M-O-J-E-E-K. And I picked them up because I asked friends, what are tiny search engines? And I figured, I figured that the uh, perpetrators, that's why I call the people running this. I don't care who they are. I call them the perpetrators. They won't have messed with those. If you search Dr. M even in those minority ones, you'll find some of the 150 interviews I have given. And you will also find my 50 publications. You will find a write-up by a former Pfizer board member about me in 2017, lauding my achievements with Zyarco. Former, the former huh. board member, John Lamatina. John Lamatina was head of R&D when I was there, and he wrote me up in Forbes magazine in 2017 because he said, what you've done is remarkable. And, yeah, we, we, we worked hard and we got lucky. Uh, and it was remarkable. Um, but no one knows that. They think I'm a conspiracy theorist. And they think, worst of all, what upsets me more is they think I'm a lousy scientist. I was a good scientist. I did all right. And um, so search me on minority search engines for the real Dr. Mike Eden and also uh, some of the interviews I've given. If you, if you like some of what you've heard, however terrifying, and you want to know more, that's the better answer to your question, Dr. Drew, earlier about social media. Go and find me on minority search engines. because, And then I would say, if you find very different hits on what is really a commodity search, I would say that's 100% proof someone is messing with the major search engines. And why? So that you don't find out what I really think. Why would they do that? Yeah. Because I'm telling the truth. Yeah. Yeah, the <laughs> military the adage, I've used, no, I've used the military adage, Dr. Yaden, uh, many, many times, you always take the most flack when you are directly over the target. Um, oh, they yeah. don't go after people who uh, who are missing the target, trust me. So I, 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 I'm cognizant of the time and how late it is there, so I, I, we're going to let you go. But I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you being here. You, you have been unbelievably courageous throughout this. Do not lose, uh, do not lose faith. Um, there are many of us out there who support you and, and the brilliant work you've done um, for the duration of this pandemic and before. So uh, thank, yeah, well, thank you. you. I, I, have, I thought a lot about speaking out or not. And I thought, if I'm right, I'm in as much danger if I don't speak out or more danger if I don't speak out. So people who think bad things will happen to me if I speak out, ladies and gentlemen, Think what will happen if you don't speak out. Seriously. Uh, but all we need to do to stop this is have enough of us say to hell with you. And it, I don't know what percentage it is, 10%. It's not many. And so I, I don't think I'm at much risk. And in the end, you have to live your life, you know, aligned to the light, telling the truth. And I'm delighted, delighted to say it was nothing to do with my scientific research, but Along the way, I have I have been retouched by faith, and it's delightful, you know, because the, the work on the other side of the fence is so bad that I remember one evening I came to the conclusion it was satanic. And I think at the same moment I realized I had allowed myself to fall out of out of contact with the creator, and uh, my life's been a lot better since. <laughs> well, there there is a there is a distinct. Uh... Humans seem to be worshiping, believing animals. And if they don't worship and believe something true and good, they will worship things that are false and bad. And uh, th th I think we're in this weird phase right now. We need to take a good look at ourselves. And, uh, you know, the, the mob, the narcissism, the, the delusional thinking, it's just like nothing I've ever imagined. But yeah. I guess we've been through periods of history like this before, and we shall... God willing, emerge again. Dr. Yaden, thank you for uh, being here. We appreciate it. We'll let you go to bed now. I know it's like 11 10, 11 o'clock out there. So uh, we'll let you be. Thank you, sir. And uh, Kelly, I'm going to see you tomorrow at uh, 3 o'clock yeah. Pacific, correct? We're going to have yep. the, the one yes, and only Steve Kirsch. He's been... Yeah, he's been asking for this uh, forum for quite some time, and finally we're going to grant it to him. He has gotten a hold of Ed Dowd, so he's undoubtedly got a head of steam from Ed's data. <laughs> and um, you know, Ron Miner, uh, you know, Steve is a businessman. He's an engineer. He's an MIT engineer. He invented essentially the fiber optic, the uh, the optical mouse. Uh, but he's a he's a good he's a brilliant mind and he's got some good interesting ideas and he's gonna bring it tomorrow to us and we'll have another stirring. He's a very passionate. Wait, we can't hear you, Susan. We didn't hear you. Oh. 
He's a very passionate man. Passionate, passionate man. He, 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 he I, I always caution him, but biology is different than engineering. You got to kind of, you know, be, be cautious, but he is uh, very assured of himself. So he's got some ideas he wants to bring us tomorrow. I think he's fine. On the other hand, I do think there's something that, that there's a credibility. And I said this with Ed Dowd yesterday. There's a, a an interesting credibility, I think, that comes from people who aren't necessarily physicians or scientists. Yeah. When yeah. The, what oh, you're yeah. saying yeah. is, I don't really understand the, the pathophysiology of this, or I couldn't explain the microbiology of it, or I couldn't explain, you know, that whatever the biodistribution of this, all I'm telling you is I'm seeing a pattern. I'm looking at numbers. Seeing I'm numbers. seeing things yeah. happening. I'm yeah. seeing things happening that are out. You know, there are people who recognize patterns and I would submit to you that Ed Dowd is a finance guy and a statistics guy and uh, Steve Kirsch as an engineer, that they are good at pattern recognition. And when something fall, is an anomalous, falls out of that pattern, it strikes them. And in some ways, they bring a purity, if you will, to the to the discussion, I think, that maybe you and I yeah. don't, because we keep trying to make sense of it in terms of, you know, yeah, well, well, yeah. what are the mitochondria doing? And, you know, we get into the granularity yeah. of it where they're just saying, I don't really know what's going on. All I'm telling you is that we never saw this before. Well, the numbers don't like match. To, to, they don't, to, they don't to, line to up. Kelly's yeah. point, Steve backed into this pandemic trying to be a good guy. And if you know this part of his story, he's got money. He said, what can I do to make a difference? And the, he talked to his friends in healthcare and pharmaceutical. And they said, repurpose mm -hmm. medication. And he selected research yeah. on fluvoxamine. Fluvoxamine has anti-inflammatory properties through the Sigma-1 receptor. He showed some very positive results in moderate COVID. He was vilified for daring to talk yeah. about anything other than, I don't know what, right. if you remember that, that time. And I just sent him yeah. an article from two months ago in Annal Annals of Internal Medicine finally broke through um, into sanity, which they are now publishing sane studies. And one of their first studies on, I, I'm saving this particular journal. I swear to God, I'm going to frame it because it's when the day that things turned around. And one of the articles, they published a study about just coming up with a basic um, age match control cohort for vaccines going forward. Shocking. And yeah. uh, just yeah. they just suggested that. And number two, a fluvoxamine budesonide study for moderate COVID that was highly positive. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I say Steve Kirsch, and I, I should have said this to Dr. Yaden too, um, uh, but there's a postage stamp sized piece of real estate um, <laughs> called the right side of history. Uh, and and mm. Steve Kirsch and, and Mike Yaden, and hopefully we uh, I I, hope so. I will, will I land hope so. will land squarely on that very small piece of real estate when this whole thing is said and done. Um, it, because, you know, however, whatever path it took Steve or others to get here, um, you know, I, I think he truly believes, you know, what he's saying, you know, oh, yeah. um, you know, there, oh, Scott does. Adams is another one, you know, Scott Adams is somebody who is pro, pro, pro vaccine. And there are people on the medical side, you know, Asim Mahatra was initially very mm -hmm. pro vaccine. And these are people who have now come to understand over time that not only the vaccines are highly problematic, but that the pandemic and everything that we've been told about them and about this. What are you holding up there? The Annals of Internal Medicine? This is the one. Yeah. <laughs> this, is the, this is the actual one. It's uh, May yeah. 23, Volume 176, Number 5. I'm, I'm holding it with me at all times. It does not leave my <laughs> side here at the desk. So I want to be proven right that they continue to publish saying stuff because I could just tell the yeah. massive turn in the editorial process right then. All right, so let's you yeah. and I leave things be. We will be back again tomorrow Great. at 3 o'clock Pacific time. All right, we'll see you then. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 273 8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. 
And you see how if it goes up way up in the top there, that's not enough room. If it gets in the middle, you're kind of okay. Right? Can right. you get it? You know what you're looking at there? I have no idea. Okay. I've never seen this before. <laughs> this is against our religion and God. That's the that's the mark of the beast right there. That's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the devil's I saw, eyes there. I saw, I saw Moses is like, a little guy's glides <laughs> over a little bit. I'm like, the no. crest of the... Yeah. <laughs> that's that's so. devil stuff. <laughs> <laughs>